At this point, I now give the floor to the session chair and moderator, Dr. Emmanuel De Dios. Dr. De Dios has been a professor of economics at the UP School of Economics since 1989. He has also served as the president of the Human Development Network Philippines since July 2012 and was also the dean of the UP School of Economics from 2007 to 2010. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Noel de Dios. Uh, in this concluding session, we shall discuss how various stakeholders can work together to harness the powerful emerging uh, technologies of fire, how we can achieve accelerated and broad-based socioeconomic development, as well as prepare for uncertainties arising from the unfolding landscape. The fire is already redefining what it means to be human and how we can engage with one another and the planet. The challenge is whether the technologies we create and use can be channeled to respect and respond to the most urgent human needs and most deeply held human values. This session shall elicit the participants' visions of the country's future in a fire landscape and shall recommend policies, strategies, and practical steps to ensure that the Philippines stays on track to achieve its goals of sustainable and inclusive development. The participants and panelists will share their views on managing both the potential risk and benefits that fire brings to the key areas of equality, employment, privacy, and trust. Attention will focus on the design of sound regulatory and legal frameworks and strong institutions that will ensure that the advances of the fire are on track to benefit all. Uh, Klaus Schwab, uh, in his book, The Fourth Industrial Revolution, said, the fire can compromise humanity's traditional sources of meaning, work, community, family, identity, or it can lift humanity into a new collective and moral consciousness based on a sense of shared identity. The choice is ours. So uh, the structure of this section is as follows. Uh, I shall ask all of the panelists to come on stage. I'll introduce them all at the same time, but, um, except for those who are not yet here. And then each of them will give a five-minute uh, uh, set of remarks uh, regarding some questions that we've kind of outlined for them. Uh, after that, there will be a... Uh, Uh, question session from the audience, uh, not very long, 10 minutes. There, there are seven uh, panelists after all. And then finally, each panelist will be asked to react, Fin uh, give final remarks about uh, five minutes per speaker again. No? So we have a very high powered uh, uh, set of panelists. Uh, I'll just introduce them on the basis of uh, uh, the way they, the order in which they'll speak and uh, ask them to come on stage uh, as I introduce them. First, I'd like to call on uh, Diwa Guinegundo, who's Deputy Governor for Monetary Stability of the Banco Central. <laughs> Diwa has served the BSP for more than three decades, and he's the most involved uh, in macroeconomic policy-making aspects of central banking. Liwa took his AB Economics cum laude at the top of his class from the School of Economics, UP, and his Master of Science from the London School of Economics. Okay. Okay. Uh, next, I'd like to call on Peter Draper. Peter is a policy and regulatory analyst with a focus on trade and investment policies in Southern African and emerging markets. He founded Tutwa Consulting Group, where he's, he was managing director and is currently 
the Executive Director of the Institute for International Trade at the University of Adelaide, Australia. He is non-resident senior fellow at the European Center for International Political Economy in Brussels, and is a former senior research fellow in the Economic Diplomacy Program at the South African Institute of International Affairs. He's part-time lecturer at Wits Business School. Uh, Winston de Marillo is uh, executive chairman of Amihan, a leading digital enterprise transformation company in ASEAN. He served as the chief strategy officer of a PLDT group and managing director of PLDT Capital. He's a Silicon Valley veteran with over 20 years of experience as a technology entrepreneur and venture capital professional. professional venture capitalist. Uh, Winston was among the highest performing venture capital executives at Intel, having led the majority of investments of his investments to either a successful initial public offering or a profitable corporate acquisition. He's the founder of several startups, including Blue Code, a company specializing in Java server software. Blue Code was acquired by IBM in 2005. Damarillo is an active participant and member of the Global Agenda Council of, in the World Economic Forum and was among the WEF's Young Global Leaders of 2010. He has a best-selling book, Ready or Not, The Six Big Disruptions That Will Change the Way We Do Business. Then there's uh, Mr. Alvin Kulaba. He's University Fellow and full Professor of Mechanical Engineering at De La Salle University. He's also a fellow, he's also a national, uh, a member of the National Academy of Science and Technology. Uh, Alvin has received numerous awards and citations for his pioneering research and energy policy studies. He is the pioneer in the area of life cycle assessment in the Philippines and Asia. He's the first to apply LCA to the sustainability analysis of manufacturing processes. He uses knowledge-based intelligent systems, fuzzy logic, neural networks, and other algorithms to model and analyze industrial systems. He is published proficiently in scientific journals. He was an energy advisor and independent board member of the Philippine Electric Market Corporation, PEMC. And has he has consulted with more than 150 companies in the Philippines. Then, uh, Dr. Christopher Bernido, is president of the Central Design Institute Foundation. He obtained his PhD in 1982 from the State University of New York at Albany and BS at the University of the Philippines. Chris has taught for 17 years, taught for 17 years at Diliman and he was director of the NIP in UP from 1983 to 1986. But these days, aside from his high-powered physics, he, together with his wife, Maribik, I think who's also there, Maribik, <laughs> were given the Ramon Magsaysay Award in 2010, 2010 for improving basic education in the Philippines to their innovative CVIF dynamic learning program. And therefore, when it comes to education, he's the person to go to, aside from high-powered physics. Okay. Who else is here? Wala na? One, two, three, four, five. Am I missing somebody? Okay, I shall announce the other participants as they as they arrive. So we can begin with the uh, I hope the uh, what the question that we posed to uh, the Banco Central was this: a big part of uh, fired, uh, the new technologies, is going to affect the macroeconomic and financial sectors. What are those implications in your mind? And how can leaders in the banking and entire financial sector embrace digital transformation innovation? And how quickly should they? Is fire in finance a force for inclusion or exclusion? That's a constant theme that uh, keeps on arising when we discuss the new technology. What are the risks to the public? if any, that are posed by the rapid or late adoption of FIRE technology in finance. And 
specific to the BSP, the BSP has actually been a, uh, a model in its ability to respond to fintech and other new technologies. Uh, this morning we are talking about uh, uh, taking a more open attitude to innovation rather than precaution. And I think BSP has managed to bridge that, uh, that uh, uh, to tread that, th that narrow path very well. So given that, what can be learned from BSP's experience that will help other regulators improve their fire adaptability in their own sectors? So, Diwa, could you uh, accommodate us by uh, addressing at least some of those questions in the, in the time given? Thank you very much, uh, Noel. <clears throat> well, first, I'd like to thank uh, PIDS for inviting the BSP to this very important uh, gathering. <clears throat> I suppose um, a lot of uh, things have been said about uh, the fourth uh, industrial revolution. We all are excited about it, but I think uh, as someone uh, described it, it could also be a perfect storm. And therefore, uh, with excitement at how uh, the fourth industrial revolution can bring about change and change has to be meaningful we also have to be aware of the possible risks that uh, we can face with this uh, uh, fourth industrial revolution as policymakers the challenge to us is not just to walk with the technology but um, to anticipate what the next move will be and in fact uh, be at pace with the technology and anticipate those challenges. We need to be responsive and if necessary be ingenious to the demanding needs of uh, our time. Otherwise, even central banking may be obsolete or irrelevant. Okay? Well, there is ongoing work being done by various field experts to address the challenge of the fourth industrial revolution in their respective fields. The future is still under construction for all intents and purposes. In other words, we are navigating into still uncharted territory. And in this uh, crucial time, the point is to be prepared, to be anticipatory. Now, with respect to central banking, I can mention three areas where the fourth industrial revolution is most relevant. One is on how to deal with fintech companies. Second is regulation and uh, supervision, or what they call regtech and subtech. And finally, the issue of cryptocurrency or the issue of virtual uh, currency. Now, <clears throat> fintechs are disrupting the financial ecosystem in the sense that they are able to disband, dis uh, unbundle and reassemble financial services without necessarily using their balance sheets. They have been providing intermediary services and provide solutions to many customers, whether households or corporates. And this adds complexity to the role of regulators, even in terms of uh, the conduct of monetary policy. Now, since tech prompts a shift in banking distribution channels from brick and mortar branches of the commercial banks and savings banks, as well as uh, the smaller rural banks and cooperative banks, in favor of the internet and mobile services, the traditional financial institutions have realized that collaboration may be the best path to long-term growth. In short, we are building a small ecosystem where the fourth industrial revolution is most felt. Now, most fintech innovations are on the payment system. It allows peer-to-peer uh, -peer value exchange without the involvement of trusted third parties like the bank. So, 
The evidence so far suggests, therefore, that while fintech companies are very, very useful, it can also bypass the services of the banks and possibly create incentives for shadow banking. And so this is something that we need to promote, the synergy between fintech companies and banks so that the financial transactions between these two entities will still be under the ambit of the central bank. And this is test and learn. And this is what we did when we considered the issue of GCAS and smart money that was in 2004. Five years later, we found that the experiment was successful and appropriate regulations were established to govern the use of e-currency or e-money in the financial system. I think my, my time is up. Probably we can address some of the issues uh, during the Q&A session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Diwa. That was great. Uh, uh, now I'll ask uh, Peter uh, Draper the following question, uh, which he has the answer to. <laughs> So Peter, you, you've been um, a consultant and you've had, you have a global view of um, trade and investment uh, trends in the world. No? What do you think is the implication of uh, FIRE on globalization and regional integration? The emerging division of labor, uh, how would that be changing? How important is an open trade and investment regime in the FIRE era? Is, are the threats to uh, you know, freer trade in the coming in the coming years, or at present, does that represent a potential uh, subversion of uh, the trends that fire uh, represents? And what are the opportunities and risks, as usual, associated with increased cross-border flows of data uh, rather than just uh, goods? Um, Peter. Well, thanks very much, Mr. Moderator, and thanks very much to PIDS for inviting me here. It have been fascinating conversations this morning and this afternoon. Um, in five minutes, I'm going to try and tackle some very difficult questions. Uh, so the answer to the first question, is an open global trade and investment regime necessary to support FIRE? I think the answer is yes, it has to be. What that encourages is flows of people, goods, services, knowledge, and it's the nexus of these things that promotes technology uptake and development. Of course, that has its risks, but at the end of the day, I think fire is inevitable anyway. Uh, it also raises questions about how all of this will be regulated at the global level, but also at regional levels. At the global level, there's probably only one game in town, and that's the World Trade Organization. Um, we could spend a lot of time talking about that. Just a couple of observations. Uh, firstly, um, it's in trouble. I think we all know that, and perhaps that's something we can pick up on in the conversation. Why is it in trouble? What can be done about it? Lots of questions and debates to be had about that. But I would just observe that the WTO does not cover all the regulatory domains that uh, fire requires and represents. And that in itself is the challenge that the WTO has to face. Which then brings us to the regional level, which I was also asked to address. And obviously there are different models, if you like, for regional economic integration. And you certainly see that in the Asia Pacific, or the Indo-Pacific, as we Australians like to say, uh, from the CPTPP, which I think is the most um, it, well, it's the closest to the kind of regulatory arrangements that fire requires or uptake of fire requires simply because its regulatory ambit goes the furthest. So it has a chapter, for instance, on e-commerce and covers a whole range of um, fire-related technologies. But we also find RCEP, uh, the FTARP, ASEAN, of course, a range of other free trade arrangements in the Asia-Pacific region, the noodle bowl, if, if you like. So which of these models is most appropriate? If I were to 
uh, make my own punt, I would say it's the CPTPP model. Of course, with the US pulling out, we, there are question marks about the future of that particular arrangement. We shouldn't forget the national levels since we're talking trade governance. So what nation states do at home, I think matters a lot as well. Um, and then this brings me to a broader question, which is how is the system as a whole evolving? And I think here, uh, because I have two minutes, I'll summarize very broadly. There are forces of integration, which we've been talking about mostly this morning. Technology, um, cross-border value chains, we saw some examples of those this morning. Consumers themselves that want to um, take up the kinds of technologies that FIRE represents. That's a very powerful force towards integration, I would suggest. But there are also forces of disintegration, and these are becoming more apparent in recent months. Uh, so on the technology side, we are seeing, I th think, currently a weak signal towards um, uh, disintegration, which is the onshoring uh, prospects. So if one thinks of, for instance, labor-intensive industries and uh, the uh, 3D printing set of technologies, the, those could represent um, challenges for labor-intensive manufacturers such as the Philippines and, and elsewhere. So the idea is that production is relocated or onshored back to the home country where the technology resides. But there are also political forces of disintegration, and these have become much more apparent, as I say, in recent months. So in a few key buzz phrases, the inequality that we heard about this morning, which is driving populism, particularly in the developed world, especially the United States, but also Europe. And of course, uh, geopolitics, I would suggest. So the US-China relationship in particular, and how that plays out in the longer term. Um, which then brings me finally to the prognosis, where does all this go? That's uh, a big puzzle, I would suggest. The media really focuses on trade wars. I think in some senses the term trade wars is a misnomer. It's actually investment technology and trade wars. Um, and in a sense, we might be entering into a new normal of hyper-competition uh, manifested as protectionism. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Um, it, this is breakneck uh, discussion, as you will note, uh, simply because uh, the, the topics are so, uh, in terms of its uh, impact, there's, we've, I think PIDS has tried as much as possible to uh, divide it into the most, uh, 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 the major uh, divisions, but, but still, we still don't have enough time to discuss uh, all of it. In any case, my only excuse, I guess, is that this is supposed to be the start, not the end of a conversation. No? Uh, in which case, uh, uh, turning now, actually, uh, trying to put some uh, uh, logic in it, we have to bring in the non-government uh, uh, sector, and that's uh, uh, Winston uh, Damarillo. Uh, the question we posed to Winston was, uh, uh, well, he's been, he's been around also in the region, but particularly with respect to the private sector. How do you think, the, how ready do you think Philippine firms are, and workers, Philippine workers and firms are to embrace fire, especially in relation to our neighbors? You, you probably have a better idea of that than most people in this room. What challenges do these firms and workers face and what elements are crucial but missing in the current business and regulatory environment that would nurture technopreneurs, uh, you're the expert there, and foster greater innovation and technology adoption among incumbent firms? Winston, please. Yeah. I think we need to fire our mic as well. <laughs> Good. Well, thank you all for um, having me here today. I'm really excited to talk about this topic, in particular because when we introduced uh, the fourth industrial revolution, or at the time, Industry 4.0 in Davos, there was a great big concern in whether that movement is more suitable for industrialized economies. True. 
and there was a bigger concern about what that will bring to emerging economies like the Philippines, right? So I, in particular, was worried about it. And um, what's exciting is that for the past two years, we've only seen the fourth industrial revolution elements to bring about something different, something new for us. Uh, whereas it's competitiveness and cost savings in emerged countries or uh, developed countries, it has brought uh, to emerging countries two new elements, inclusion being one and more equitable wealth distribution. So when I look about the impact of fire in the region in Southeast Asia, I look at three vectors, right? Number one is the ability of our industry to transform, the transformational velocity and capacity to do it. The second is the cultural adaptiveness of the consumers within that region on whether we're ready uh, to consume technologies or services that come from, from fire-enabled companies. <clears throat> and finally, the ecosystem, right, to sustain the movement of fire. And I'm really happy to report that, first of all, the Philippines is probably among the leaders when you compare it to the ASEAN region, number one. Number two, our industries are taking it to heart and actually implementing it. And I'll cite one in particular, and that's banking, right? And this is where regulation actually helps. Uh, <clears throat> BSP being concerned a lot about inclusion, being open to fintech as a model, and new technologies like blockchain as fair game, uh, it really opened up uh, the mindset of our banking sector uh, to really adapt technologies that not only will improve their profits, uh, but really improve the way they serve the consumers. And we see this in our everyday life today, right? Um, <clears throat> in the region, there's massive movements towards a cashless society. Uh, you're going to see more and more QR codes in supermarkets. Uh, very soon, it's even going to be more prevalent because we've decided to standardize on uh, technologies like EMV Co. <clears throat> lending, micro lending, you know, the, the heart of the capitalization for our uh, micro, uh, a million micro businesses in the Philippines is also becoming more prevalent and even going to be uh, sustained with technology, right? Very simple technologies that we use in our daily lives like chatbots or messengers will now be engines to lend five million people, you know, small amounts of money to capitalize their cottage industries. <clears throat> so as far as the Philippines and where we are in adopting fire technologies and concept, I, th I think we're doing quite well compared to our neighbors. Uh, where we think we lack and where we think we can improve some more is in the area of creating an ecosystem for sustainable success. And this is where um, not only do we need to increase the velocity of sharing our best practices, it's also where regulation can also help. Uh, not just in funding our entrepreneurs, but also enabling connectivity between small entrepreneurs and the large established business. Uh, it's very easy to build technologies. It's really hard to find consumers. And if there is a way to connect our largest industries to our smallest, most innovative uh, startups, we should be able to, to do that. The third piece is actually a strategic advantage for us. The Filipino culture in adapting new technology is superior compared to our neighbors. Right? We adapt technology far faster than anybody else in the region. And we tend to accelerate transformation of the way we do business based on that technology. So <clears throat> in general, I think the, pro the prognosis for fire transformation in, in the Philippines is very, very good. Um, I think that it should be heralded or led by government industries, uh, such as the BSP, in creating regulations to do that. In similar fashion, the DOST and the DTI is putting together collaborative environments, shared services environments, and setup that helps our classic and traditional entrepreneurs transform from regular shoemaking to technology-aided shoemaking, or you know, pushing something that the Philippines is really known for, it's upcycling technologies you know, from trash to ex extremely great bags, and bring it down to the masses. So we're really doing well in, in, in that aspect of it. Um, what I feel we need is a, a more unifying strategy and a more visible strategist. Right? Because in Filipino, we have many ideas. Right? But we need to point out to someone with passion, with a goal, with a metric that says we will succeed when we get there. <clears throat> but I think the fourth industrial revolution, when you think about it two years after it was initially introduced in a bigger scale in Davos, uh, is proving to be 
a great platform for progress here in the Philippines, and I think we've got a great starting point, and, and we have a good future ahead of us. Thank you. Uh, it's good that uh, you tied it in uh, to something that Diwa said, that the banking sector is actually one of the um, uh, success stories in the, in the fire. No? Uh, 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 boy de, uh, Fortunato de la Peña of the DOST. And also Secretary Eliseo Rio of the Department of Information, Communication and Technology. In a way, that's for, uh, that's fortuitous that uh, in the end they will have to respond uh, from the government side. <laughs> Okay, so uh, next I'd like to ask uh, uh, Alvin to uh, respond to the question we originally posed, and that was this. Uh, uh, Alvin is well known for the life cycle uh, uh, assessment, no? uh, which has to do with the environment. And therefore, we decided to ask him uh, about one aspect that affects the Philippines and uh, what it has to do with fire. The Philippines is among the most vulnerable cl countries to climate change. So how can we har harness fire innovation to address environmental issues? As a scientist, inventor, and policy advisor, what is your assessment of the overall governance of science and technology? <laughs> what role do you envision the Philippines to be playing in the S&T landscape in the next decade or so? And how can you improve that role? And which actor should be uh, involved no? uh, as, a, as a practitioner? No? Thank you, Noel. So I'm uh, wearing the hat as a private citizen. <laughs> oh, well, uh, having been uh, you know, in the academe and uh, of course uh, also uh, doing research and uh, teaching and doing consulting. On well, the first question, uh, uh, you know, uh, what can fire technology uh, you know, help uh, address the environmental issues that we have? You know, the uh, fire technologies, um, you know, those that have been uh, mentioned earlier, uh, has already been there. No? It's just that whether we have actually capitalized those, uh, you know, technologies to address the problems of the environment, that's something which has been, uh, you know, a matter that uh, we need to look at. Because the problem of the uh, environment has been there for many years. In fact, if we look at uh, you know, the problem back in the early 90s uh, to the problem now, they're still the same. You know, the problems in the environment, it's because of us. Uh, that's why we should be able to, to solve it also ourselves. No? It's primarily because we're using the linear economy. The linear economy, we buy, uh, you know, products are made, we buy, we use, and dispose of. That's what we do, and that's what causes our environmental issues and problems. That probably many also uh, lead to, you know, this climate change, uh, you know, phenomenon. We need to think, uh, you know, from the life cycle perspective. Look at it, the whole value chain, no? From where you have to acquire the, you know, raw materials and bring it to the production floor, and you know, produce, uh, make it, use it, and finally dispose it out. And we have to embrace now what you call as the circular economy. That is what uh, you know, countries like uh, Taiwan is doing, Korea is doing. We need to be able to capitalize on these particular technologies to be able to find alternative ways to be more resource efficient. So if you look at uh, you know, the technologies that we have, we have the uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, you, know, you can use machine learning, uh, deep learning, uh, internet of things to gather data so that you will be able to come up with something new. So rather than probably, uh, you know, dispose of a particular uh, material or product uh, at, at the end of its, uh, you know, economic life, there must be some other uses, you know, that we can actually uh, utilize uh, the material from. And we have to draw 
a number of information and data. And at this time, when you have already the cloud, already cloud, you can develop uh, cloud-based computing with, with AI, you know, you will be able to bring all the data and be able to access, uh, you know, this particular data anytime, uh, anywhere. And that is actually what probably these technologies would help to address, uh, you know, the environmental issues. On the question about how I look the governance of the science and technology, uh, while it is true that the, uh, the Department of Science and Technology has demanded, uh, you know, on matters that relate to science and technology, there are also other agencies that are engaged in research and development, or SNT, you know, like health, agriculture, environment, even national defense. So how, you know, does the DOST work with the rest of the, you know, so it has to be some kind of the, as Dr. Albert mentioned earlier, a whole of the government approach or a whole of the nation approach. That's something that will have to be uh, looked at. On the uh, last question on, uh, what was that? Uh, sorry, Noel. There's the, ah, uh, uh, what will be? Uh, the Ah, okay. In what way, uh, you know, the SNT community uh, be involved? No? I think we have to follow a quadruple helix, you know, where it's not only the government, the industry, and, you know, the academy working together, but also the civil society. With the enormous problems now that has, you know, has resulted to environmental, uh, you know, uh, destruction or all these environmental issues. We need to involve the community. We need to involve the ordinary people in, you know, we have to engage them in the discussion of what solutions we have, no? From the point of view of the scientists, uh, you know, in the academe or in the government. So I think uh, in the whole of the government approach that would involve also the, you know, the civil society. So let's move away, I think, from the triple helix where you have the government, industry, academe working together by expanding it, including the civil society. And therefore, I think the quadruple helix model will work better in this uh, type of problems. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that actually uh, serves as a segue to uh, what we want to ask Chris. Chris, as you know, is involved both in the the most basic level of education to the highest level of uh, research. No? And if you take a look at it, it's a, develop, it's a, it's a challenge for the development of uh, the youth. So we wanted to ask Chris, how can we best prepare the Filipino youth and the entire citizens, citizenry? You're talking about, uh, Alvin was talking about involvement of the community. For FIRE, to ensure that prosperity becomes more inclusive, what are the important negative and positive implications of fire for the education sector and what's the appropriate public policy response? What changes do you foresee, if any, for the role of family, peers, community in the education of youth for skills, ethic, and citizenship? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Pitts for the invitation. Everybody seems to be wondering how to prepare a workforce ready for fire and the next generation of work. My thinking is that we should go back to the fundamentals. Go back to the basics, things we are familiar with, things which are under our control. Um, what type of workforce do we really need in the face of fire? You need individuals, not only in management, but also in the rank and file, who are analytical thinkers, right? But how do you develop individuals or workforce uh, who have to learn a new skill every five years because the skills that they know become obsolete? How, how do we develop analytical thinkers? And this is what I mean by we go back to fundamentals, we go back to the basics, and I'll try to elaborate that in two ways. Going back to the, how do you, uh, analytical people are <clears throat> logical thinkers. It's as simple as that. They know how to analyze the cause and effect, okay? But where do you really first learn logic? 
you first learn logic in your elementary and high school math. Right? Which means that if you violate a rule, you don't get the right answer. So, you go back to the fundamentals. You should, the student should learn their math and science well. And besides, if you ask any computer scientist, they would say, what's the best preparation for computer science? They would say, mathematics. Right? And even if you teach everyone how to program and how to code, if they do not think logically, the program will not run. They don't even know what to solve, what the end point is. Right? Now, so that's what I mean by going back to the basics. Students simply learn well the science and math that they should learn in high school. Now, I have to make a warning. Different teaching methodologies have different outcomes. So I would be remiss if I would not mention the dynamic learning program, which was discussed a moment ago. And uh, so we have that in mind in the DLP, or dynamic learning program, which is applicable from rich to poor schools, from uh, economically disadvantaged uh, schools, and so on. And the second aspect of going back to the fundamentals, which we have full control of, we should not forget that all these new technologies are based on science. And the sciences were discovered 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 400 years ago. It's the same science that has bred these fast-changing technologies. If you want a new technology, it's a technology that cannot violate the laws of science, cannot violate the laws of nature. You want new innovation? No innovation can violate the laws of science. So you see, just learn your science well and your math well. And that would be the best way to prepare our workforce. And in fact, that type of preparation we have not really mastered yet. So we're still in first base, but you know if you want a critical thinking workforce, an analytical work workforce, if you want them to think logically, the first place they will learn it is in school. And we have full control of that. And we need not, we need not be afraid of fire. So that's my thinking. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce uh, Secretary De La Peña. Uh, uh, Dr. De La Peña started his career with the UP College of Engineering. He was director of uh, UP's Institute for Small Scale Industries, as well as vice president for planning and development. Uh, then he moved over to DOST, where he has served for uh, almost three decades. And he's credited with playing a key role in creating and implementing several government programs, such as technology business incubation and the manufacturing productivity extension program, which has been supporting small in enterprises. Uh, he took his BS degree in chemical engineering, an MS from UP, and a PhD in business ad from UP as well. Uh, the involvement of Secretary De La Peña with small-scale industries uh, is a lifelong uh, concern, and therefore we thought he was partnership for R&D between government, academe, and industry more effective and sustainable. All of that in only five minutes. I'm sorry for it. <laughs> Thank you. Well. Uh, First of all, I think I uh, would prefer to uh, talk about the strategy of uh, DOST as far as contributing to uh, our development is concerned. Uh, approaching uh, IR 4.0 is just a part of it, okay? And uh, to me, we take off from uh, what the president would like to see and uh, this is how to reduce inequality. And uh, for us, uh, it means uh, taking a look at uh, how our uh, regions, provinces perform, for example, in terms of uh, contributing to uh, production and uh, how, how are their productivities uh, uh, in comparison with one another. So we have uh, adapted, really, 
a very region-oriented uh, development now at the Department of Science and Technology. Whether we are talking of uh, research and development or uh, technology transfer or introducing uh, uh, technology interventions to our uh, enterprises or even in the uh, strategy for human resource uh, development. So that means uh, trying to expand our R&D pool okay, uh, to go beyond the usual traditional exclusive uh, group of universities, for example, who have been uh, uh, benefiting from our grants for so many years. Okay? But what I want to see is uh, how these institutions, uh, R&D and efforts will redound to the benefit of our people, of our productive enterprises. And so we are trying to uh, uh, capacitate okay, the different uh, institutions in the regions because they know better the needs and the opportunities there. So with respect to um, our uh, approach to uh, upgrading our enterprises, uh, I am tempted to say that um, it is not enough to do surveys. You have to see them face to face, okay? I see these enterprises maybe at the rate of uh, at least 10 enterprises a month, okay? And you can see the uh, varying degrees of where they are. Maybe it's still 1.0, okay? In some cases, I was, I was there in Alaminos yesterday in a community producing salt, okay? It's not the solar salt, which is, uh, I think, all, also primitive, but this is the one where they cook. Uh, their salt, okay? But we have introduced a uh, new uh, value-adding and uh, low-abiding uh, product, which is uh, iodized uh, salt. And they are very open to it. But uh, the first thing to do is improve their basic production uh, facility. Two minutes na? <laughs> anyway, uh, so, what I'm trying to say is that if you look at the cross-section of our productive enterprises, particularly the small ones, um, there are those that uh, you have to leave from 1.0 to 2.0. There are those that you have to leave from 2.0 to 3.0. There are those that are prepared to go from 3.0 to 4.0. Maybe those that are catering to the big industries, by providing the inputs, they are the uh, uh, source of the inputs that the big industries use are prepared and should be prepared right away for 4.0. But uh, I think uh, we should really uh, understand the situation. Okay? Um, next is that uh, I just would like to uh, mention that uh, this uh, link between uh, the different sectors is really very important. And uh, what we did in the case of uh, our programs in DOST, particularly in the research aspect, is that uh, we are, where well, the kinder word is motivating, but uh, the better word is forcing. Uh, I'm referring to the uh, researchers in the university and to the research and to the people of interest uh, regarding research in industry. Uh, more and more firms are realizing that they need to do research, but they do not have the people nor the facilities to do research, okay? Sometimes, as uh, I think it was a finding of David Hall before, they don't trust each other, industry and, uh, and academe. But I think we can do something about that. So uh, what we did, and uh, it's gaining a lot of acceptance, and um, uh, we are receiving a lot of uh, applications, is that we tell the firms, if you want a research done, okay, and you do not have the people nor the facilities, uh, the best way is for you to identify an institution, preferably a university willing to do the work for you, a university which you trust. We will not even force you which university you trust. And if you combine your resources, we will add on to it, okay? And uh, we, are, we are, I think, uh, gaining a lot out of that uh, strategy. As far as 4.0 is concerned, we are preparing ourselves by having the facilities that they need for better uh, services, for better opportunities to uh, prototype, for better opportunities to uh, uh, do the R&D, and uh, also uh, to make our services more accessible by using the platform technologies, ICT, the genomics, uh, and others that are very important, including artificial intelligence. So we will not be left behind, but we have to 
consider the differences in the status of our firms. We cannot just uh, tell the uh, the remote <laughs> the, the indices in the remote areas. We will bring you to 4.0. They will not understand it. So we have to really be realistic. Surveys are not enough. Go there. <laughs> Thank you very much, Secretary De La Peña. And now uh, to Secretary Rio. Secretary Rio uh, is uh, Secretary, as uh, we all know, of uh, the Department of ICT, a uh, newly established department. His office is in charge of the formulation of policies, planning, and programming of cybersecurity and emergency communications, and the implementation of strategic programs and projects and regional operations. Uh, he began his career in the military and he possesses degrees in electronics and communication engineering and electrical engineering from University of the East and University of the Philippines. And he also completed various military courses uh, and was one of the top notchers in the electronics engineer licensure exams. Uh, Secretary Rio, we'd like to ask, uh, well, it's obvious, but uh, what are the policies and plans of the DICT to ensure the country's ICT infrastructure is fire adapted? How should we address technological risks on security and trust, especially cybersecurity? The unethical use of data by both state and private actors for intrusive surveillance and mind conditioning, as well as the overuse of technology for building and deploying uh, new weapons. So. Um, Okay, yeah. thank you for that. Thank you. So my time ta starts now. Uh, okay, um, the ICT is the newest department of our government. Now we are only uh, two years old. Uh, created June of 2016, and um, we are now uh, in the midst of the fire. No, uh, the uh, fourth industrial revolution. ICT ready for the fire. No, you might get burned no? <laughs> if you say, uh, honestly, honestly, no, um, our ICT infrastructure um, has, well, has a big room for improvement. No? When Jack Mao came here about uh, four months ago, the first thing he did was to test our um, internet access, no? And uh, his uh, comment was, no good. Actually, he was directing that to my department. <laughs> Saying, uh, well, the department has to do something to improve our ICT services. No? So that is our first priority now. How do we um, improve our infrastructure first? No? Basically, all of our ICT infrastructure now are invested or owned by private sector. The government has almost no investment on ICT infrastructure. No? It is like, uh, imagine the Philippines, where all the roads network are built by private uh, investment. So we have to pay toll, and we will, we will have few of this type of roads if government does not put in its own investment. No? So basically, that is what is now defining I, our ICT infrastructure. All financed by uh, uh, private sector, so it is slow and expensive. That describes more or less our um, situation today. And no good, <laughs> as uh, Jack Ma would have uh, described it. So we're going to infrastructure. Um, we are now going into uh, um, government putting up the more critical infrastructure in a uh, ICT environment. Now, first, there are five actually components. No? And um, the first one is the international gateway facilities where we are connected to the outside world. Right now, all our IGF are owned by the private telcos, more spe uh, specifically the big telcos, Globe and Smart. Government, zero. No? But uh, we signed a um, tripartite agreement with Facebook such that uh, for the first time, 
we are going to have our own international gateway, the government, outside of Globe and Smart. No? Now, the backbone. The backbone, again, Globe and Smart made their own uh, nationwide backbone. They did not even share. No? They could have, uh, uh, well, made things uh, better for their subscriber had they shared facilities. They even don't share their uh, cell sites. No? So imagine Globe put a, up a cell site here and a few meters away, Smart put up their own cell site. Well, will they uh, get their uh, ROI here from their subscriber? Had they joined and uh, shared that cell site, that would re reduce the cost for the subscribers. And they can build more uh, cell sites because cell sites, the number of cell sites that we have is what is making our internet access slow and expensive, no? The way we are now connecting to the internet is through our cell phone. Globe and Smart wants us to connect to them through their, uh, their uh, cell sites, no? Why don't they put, let's say, fixed broadband? They're doing that now, but basically in a limited way. Basically because putting up those uh, fixed wide broadband will really compete with their mobile service. So the, even how much you will try to put more uh, um, wide broadband on fixed places like uh, homes, establishment, offices, for example, in this room, how many are connected to the Wi-Fi of uh, this uh, hotel? I see, no? Oh, well, look, less than 10%. All of us, our cell phone, are connected to the cell site of Global Smart outside. So, um, time is up, as they said, uh, but uh, let me emphasize that the only way for us to be ready for the fire is to light up our ICT infrastructure. Thank you very much. A very apt uh, metaphor. Um, now, uh, let's give the audience a chance to uh, ask some questions from our uh, panelists. Um, as the usual, uh, please state your name and keep your question uh, really brief. And please, uh, Specify to whom in particular you would like to ask the, the question. So, do I see any hands? Yes, P Peter. Rafaelita Aldaba from um, the Department of Trade and Industry. I would just want to uh, direct my question to uh, Secretary Rio. Um, of course, we know that uh, the physical infrastructure is crucial in uh, our building the innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem. And um, can you update us, sir, with respect to uh, uh, the entry of the third uh, player? When is this going to happen? And uh, w w what is the current status? Okay, the president gave us a deadly deadline, no? because if we do not meet that deadline, we are dead. <laughs> uh, the president wants it uh, that before Christmas or maybe early December, we will have the third telco. And that is why, in fact, I was late uh, this afternoon because we were uh, finalizing the terms of reference. So uh, on Thursday or, or Friday, the latest, the uh, final version of the terms of reference will be published. No? And by uh, law, uh, we need to have it published in 15 days before it becomes effective. And when it becomes effective, then we can, uh, uh, the contenders can now get their uh, bidding documents. No? Um, they can buy the bidding documents, and I think uh, it's about 1 million pesos per uh, bid. No? In other words, if you are not, if you cannot afford that, then you have no uh, business being the third telco. Because the third telco, uh, must be able to compete with Globe and Smart. Uh, Globe and Smart, between themselves, have already 130 million subscribers. So here comes a third telco with zero subscribers. 
And the only way he can create his own uh, uh, subscription base is to get it from Globen Smart. So to do that, he must have both the uh, financial and the technical uh, capability. Uh, then we will give them one month or so for them to come up with their bidding documents and uh, uh, bidding date would be about uh, first week of December or roughly before the, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the bidding date would be about uh, uh, third week of uh, November uh, or if they ask for some extension, it can go as far as maybe uh, first week of December, you know? But definitely we will have a third telco before the end of the year. Or definitely we will be kicked out of government services. So that is how deadly the deadline set for us by the president. Any more hands? Yes, the gentleman. Yes, you uh, in the checkered shirt. Um, good afternoon. I'm Sok Bansuela from a National Confederation of Family Farmer Organizations, Pakisama. Um, this afternoon in our breakout session, our resource person uh, shared to us uh, that the first three revolutions, um, industrial revolutions, have not um, promoted a culture that brought us, uh, an, an agriculture that brought us better health, greater prosperity, and better uh, environment. In fact, it promoted a monoculture, industrial agriculture. Um, good afternoon. I'm Sok Bansuela from a National Confederation of Family Farmer Organizations, Pakisama. Um, this afternoon, in our breakout session, our resource person uh, shared to us uh, that the first three revolutions, uh, industrial revolutions, have not um, promoted a culture that brought us, uh, an agriculture that brought us better health, greater prosperity, and better uh, environment. In fact, it promoted a monoculture, industrial agriculture uh, that brought us to where we are. No? Most of our farmers remain to be poor, um, and then we're destroying the environment, and, 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 and we are not healthier as before. We have one out of 11 Filipinos diabetic already because of our predominantly rice uh, culture. Um, now the question is, how could this fourth industrial revolution possibly harness or change uh, the trajectory, possibly achieve greater health, greater, um, uh, better food systems or better agriculture? Or in particular, how would possibly the fourth industrial revolution uh, specifically address the key issues in agriculture, greater inequality? Until now, we, we still uh, have a very slow implementation of our land tenure reforms, agrarian reform, fisheries code, IPRA. Or how could possibly this industrial revolution, this fourth industrial revolution, help hasten the transformation from a monocrop industrial-based agriculture to a more polyculture agriculture, especially cited to us by our resource person uh, this afternoon. Thank or you. Would you like mostly, to, to mostly would you last, like, last question no, no, is, to whom would you like to address the, the this question. is to anyone uh, from the group. No, um, the last question is about how possibly this uh, fire could hasten the, the inclusion, especially of our farmers, especially our young farmers and uh, women farmers into the um, agriculture system or and even in national development. Please. Maybe I can ask uh, Secretary de la Peña to... to, to address. Well, well uh, I, uh, I will have two uh, statements. Uh, uh, first of all, I think our various production sectors are too much regulated. We, solve, we try to, to solve our problems by putting in more and more regulations, and that makes it more unattractive for the uh, investor or worker who can really make it happen, okay? Secondly, I think uh, 
we should really try to encourage our young educated people to go into into these areas okay I, you know, I, I, I will just uh, cite an example. I was going around the, uh, the, the, the uh, enterprises that we have assisted, which includes, of course, associations of farmers. And uh, this is, uh, of course, in the interest of upgrading technology. I was brought by uh, my uh, co-worker in Iloilo to a, uh, a farmers association in Saraga, in the town of Saraga. And uh, this is an association of 30 small farmers. It's small land holdings, uh, they joined together. And uh, I was so surprised because the president of the Farmers Association is a graduate of the Philippine Science High School. You know, it makes a lot of difference. Uh, the way they are managed, the way they have introduced technology, he attracted three more members from the Philippine Science High School Iloilo graduate to work with them. And uh, I think uh, because of their uh, leadership and uh, uh, contributions, okay, the, the, even the choice of the products and the, and the technology that they will use uh, 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 makes a difference. So what did I see? They, they focused on a particular product. They just produced colored rice. Okay, I I work on my black rice, so <laughs> my black rice, my red rice, my brown rice, and uh, because that is commanding a higher price in the market, it is not regulated. Okay, and they introduce a lot of technologies. The members who are actually graduates of uh, ECE were already designing robots that can remove the weeds out of the plots. Okay, because they cannot attract workers now just to do that. I mean, I, I, I think, uh, I don't know how uh, we can convince the younger people. That's why in the OST, we have added a new program to our scholarship program. It's the Patriot program. We are in effect, I don't want to use the word, but brainwashing them to be nationalistic by letting them get immersed as early as possible. Because to me, that is the only way by which we can improve the situation, get our younger people uh, to uh, really devote their time in our country, uh, not just think of how much they will earn, and if they don't get a good earning here, they will go abroad. Uh, there is something about culture. It's not only the monoculture for the crops, it's the culture of our young people and the older people that I think should be changed. Yeah. Winston, you would like yeah, to Yeah, I want to just yes. follow up with yeah. what Secretary has just mentioned. Now. So from the entrepreneurial side, um, a well-articulated demand always fixes a supply problem, right? And this is really promising for the Philippines, especially when we talk about not just agriculture, but food and agriculture. If you guys notice, we have more restaurants now in the Philippines that are more conscious about where our food comes from, right? Farm to table, uh, food production, organic farming, uh, single origin coffee. You know, those important words are the ones that attract the passion and the attention of the millennials. We now care about what we put, what we put in our bodies. And if we just spend a little bit more effort to say that's important and there's a market for it, it will change the dynamics of our farming community. Because we, we do have our disadvantage, right? Our lands are small. Um, the ability for us to you know, produce massive amounts of supply of rice and all of that is challenged. Uh, but we have this ability to parang refactor the demand side. And the more we talk about that, the more the imagi imagination comes back to innovation. And we, we're seeing a lot of them. There's a person I know, Cherry Atiliano, who's creating a single uh, farming community in Marinduque, where it's completely circular. They supply all the food that they need for Marinduque from Marinduque. Um, and because of doing that, they force themselves to be innovative. And I think innovation is actually not mandated. It's not a policy, unfortunately. I think innovation is inspiration, right? And I think once we connect inspiration to day-to-day -to -day realities and, you know, the technology nece necessary to make that reality the case, you will, you know, find your own passion to discover it. You know, I, I'm not a computer scientist or a computer science, actually an industrial engineer, but I made a lot of my discoveries and inventions in computer science because I was inspired to do something. 
And I think that's one thing Filipinos are good at, so I think we should nurture that uh, in this fourth industrial revolution economy. Thank you. Do you I think aside from uh, fire, there's another dimension to uh, mitigating the problems in our agricultural sector. And that is, uh, among others, access to finance. And fire can definitely uh, enhance access to finance by having a more inclusive financial system. And fire uh, would be a very good uh, instrument in bringing this about. The BSP is precisely in the, in the, at the midst of uh, ensuring that our financial system is inclusive. Having more people access the credit of the banking uh, system, uh, we have launched also the Credit Surety Fund that would allow uh, access to bank credit without collateral and without credit history. I think it's important that people have also access to bank credit or to bank finance. So I'd like to give a chance to our uh, speakers to give some final remarks. Actually, uh, we had a few questions uh, uh, prepared for them regarding, well, particularly what policies or initiatives government must pursue, um, how to make issues of science, technology, and innovation top of mind among policymakers, the private sector, and general public, and what should be included in a whole of nation action agenda for harnessing fire. You may dwell on any of those, but I think uh, it's also fruitful to, if you want to comment on some of the uh, things that have been said uh, uh, around the table. So, can I ask uh, Diwa if I, if I can? Well, from a monetary policy perspective, we are looking into the development of uh, big data analytics at the BSP. We cannot uh, always rely on the periodic, even if regular, availability of data and statistics from the PSA. Uh, we need the big data uh, system to allow us to see uh, whether tastes and preferences of the general public are changing. We need to see how uh, sales, let's say in McDonald's or in Jollibee, are uh, reflective of uh, consumption expenditure, etc. So I think the big data analytics uh, or the big data system will allow us a good idea of what's going on in the economy. And that's good for formulating uh, monetary policy with a lot of anticipation of what else is to come. On the issue of cryptocurrency, uh, our, our um, approach is uh, something that we caution. Uh, cryptocurrency does not have its own, uh, it's not a liability of uh, a monetary authority it is not guaranteed by uh, a republic, and therefore the three functions of money may not, uh, the, therefore cryptocurrency may not be compliant with those three uh, uh, functions of money. And therefore, we need to approach this issue with a great uh, care or great, great caution. Uh, the, the most that the BSP had said about this is to allow these, the so-called exchange of uh, of virtual currency with fiat money. But we have issued a, a, an advisory to the general public that they need to exercise caution in dealing with cryptocurrency. On regulation, we are now into the process of, uh, of, of, of putting up, and actually we have put up uh, the so-called reg tech and soup tech. And that means uh, uh, we will be uh, using fire in enhancing and improving the way we regulate banks, even ahead of the results of the annual uh, examination of the banks. And finally, uh, with respect to fintech, okay, we want to put up a national retail payment uh, system. It has, been, uh, it has been launched, and two automatic clearing houses have been established that would allow an establishment of an ecosystem which would make it even easier for people to exchange values uh, within, within this, uh, uh, this ecosystem. And on that basis, we can leverage on fire and improve the, trans the uh, 
uh, financial transactions as well as economic transactions uh, very effectively with very little impact on uh, the, the issues of, of, of security and privacy uh, uh, issues. Yes, sir. Well, I'll just uh, reinforce one message on the trade and investment system. So I would just encourage the Philippines to continue to advocate for open trade and investment. If I listen carefully to the secretary who was speaking about um, communications and technology and Jack Ma's experiences in coming here, I think in essence what Jack Ma is looking for is what all investors, not just foreign investors, are looking for, which is a safe predictable, open, regulatory investment regime, which would encourage the kind of investments you need to employ people and keep um, the fire show on the road, so to speak. Um, I wanted to venture a little bit beyond my pay grade into the kinds of educational requirements which were picked up on as well. So I think um, that maths and science are clearly necessary but they're not sufficient for a fire-enabled world. If I relate this earlier to the slides put up by the ADB representative, particularly his quadrants, where he had um, uh, routine versus, just trying to get what he had exactly. Yes, routine versus manual. Um, and actually the skills that are most in demand in a fire-enabled world, managerial, so if we think about that for a moment and what kind of education is required in order to produce these kinds of skills, it gets into areas like history, philosophy, critical thinking skills which are not necessarily rooted in science and, and mathematics. So I would just um, encourage a broader approach to these things. By the way, it also requires skills like emotional intelligence. Um, and I'm not sure there's well, this is probably a controversial point, but if I think about scientists and mathematicians, they're not necessarily strong in these kinds of, of skills. So a broader view is, is required, I think. Great, thank you. Um, you know, I think we're heading to a point where um, our adoption to the fourth industrial revolution is kind of not an option, it, it's a must. And uh, given that to be the case, I think we're culturally ready for it as, as people here in the Philippines, but we do need help. And I do feel like to accelerate uh, adoption to fire and to make it inclusive and felt by the masses, uh, we do need a few nationalized or national scale infrastructure. And I think we're doing, we're beginning to do that. Um, in any electronic and, and technological community, com society, electronic identity is important. Um, and I think we're, it's upon us. Um, uh, the national ID law has been signed. Uh, the, the Bankers Association of the Philippines, in cooperation with the BSP, is creating a crypto identity mechanism that you know allows us to identify ourselves wherever we are, you know, whoever we are, uh, in, with cryptology and blockchain in use. Uh, I think we're we're getting to a point where, at some point, it would be nice to have a national supply chain infrastructure uh, so that our retailers could hop onto it. Our manufacturers can, can supply to it, and cash becomes electronic. Um, we're getting to a point where it's not hard to conceive that we can have a national electronic medical records infrastructure uh, so that PhilHealth's job of serving Filipinas' health will be easier to do. Um, and a lot more things to think about. But what's important about thinking, thinking of these platforms as infrastructure is it, it becomes a magnet for entrepreneurs. We need that, right? We need to make sure that if I, I put up a business and I'm competing with the largest banks and the largest um, telcos or the largest retailers, that the, the playing field's been leveled, right? And this is one of the things I do think the government can do to help, right? It's, it's level the playing field for us technologically, and, and we will put the capital. We will stake the ground, we'll take the risk, right? And this is, in my opinion, the way to really bring the promise of the fourth industrial revolution, not just to be the biggest companies, but to the smallest players in the industry in the most needy emerging countries like ours. Okay, um, 
uh, the government now has invested a lot in uh, human resource, uh, uh, you know, development. We're actually training, um, you know, graduates at the master's level and at the PhD, you know, level. What I would like to see is that, uh, you know, these graduates, especially in engineering, where they are taught on technopreneurship, once they graduate, they don't know where they want to go. There are not many opportunities for them. Even in the academe, they cannot be absorbed, you know. So I think uh, earlier, uh, Deputy Director Ginogundo was saying, access to capital. Can the capital be accessed by new graduates? Those who have the knowledge, been trained academically on this entrepreneurial, you know, but they need mentors. They need, how, how do you start? You know, the startup, it's easy to say, you know, the startup, even at La Salle, it has been a struggle, no? To set up a, a company, you know. So I think we have to prepare also on the side, no? Those who are, uh, you know, uh, trained to, uh, you know, in science and technology must need some kind of mentors, you know, how they can set up businesses, how can they access micro, you know, financing so they can, you know, start and apply their, their knowledge. Otherwise, we will again send them to, you know, somewhere else. The second is, uh, I would like, uh, you know, uh, to revive the idea of the science attache, uh, you know, uh, program. In the past, there was such, you know, program. And I know in the last three, uh, uh, three years ago or four years ago, uh, the DOST was, was considering, uh, you know, establishing these science attaches. Now, these science attaches are, you know, probably scientists or DOS, you know, that are, uh, who are deployed, you no? Know? And that's good for formulating uh, monetary policy with a lot of anticipation of what else is to come. On the issue of cryptocurrency, uh, our, our um, approach is uh, something that we caution. Uh, cryptocurrency does not have its own, uh, it's not a liability of uh, a monetary authority. It is not guaranteed by uh, a republic. And therefore, the three functions of money may not, uh, therefore, cryptocurrency may not be compliant with those three uh, uh, functions of money. And therefore, we need to approach this issue with a great uh, care or great, great caution. Uh, the, the most that the BSP had said about this is to allow these, the so-called exchange of, uh, of virtual currency with fiat money. But we have issued a, a, an advisory to the general public that they need to exercise caution in dealing with cryptocurrency. On regulation, we are now into the process of, uh, of, of, of putting up, and actually we have put up uh, the so-called reg tech and soup tech. And that means uh, uh, we will be uh, using fire in enhancing and improving the way we regulate banks, even ahead of the results of the annual uh, examination of the banks. And finally, uh, with respect to fintech, Okay. We want to put up a national retail payment uh, system. It has, been, uh, it has been launched, and two automatic clearing houses have been established. That would allow an establishment of an ecosystem which would make it even easier for people to exchange values uh, within, within this, uh, uh, this ecosystem. And on that basis, we can leverage on fire and improve the, trans, the uh, uh, financial transaction as well as economic transactions uh, very effectively with very little impact on uh, the, the issues of, of, of security and privacy uh, uh, issues. Yes, sir. Well, I'll just uh, reinforce one message on the trade and investment system so i would just encourage the philippines to continue to advocate for open trade and investment if i listen carefully to the secretary who was speaking about um, communications and technology and jack ma's experiences in coming here i think in essence what jack ma is looking for is what all 
investors, not just foreign investors, are looking for, which is a safe, predictable, open, regulatory investment regime, which would encourage the kind of investments you need to employ people and keep um, the fire show on the road, so to speak. Um, I wanted to venture a little bit beyond my pay grade into the kinds of educational requirements which were picked up on as well. So I think um, that maths and science are clearly necessary, but they're not sufficient for a fire-enabled world. If I relate this earlier to the slides put up by the ADB representative, particularly his quadrants, where he had um, uh, routine versus, just trying to get what he had exactly. Yes, routine versus manual. Um, and actually the skills that are most in demand in a fire-enabled world, managerial. So if we think about that for a moment and what kind of education is required in order to produce these kinds of skills, it gets into areas like history, philosophy, critical thinking skills which are not necessarily rooted in science and, and mathematics. So I would just um, encourage a broader approach to these things. By the way, it also requires skills like emotional intelligence. Um, and I'm not sure there's well, this is probably a controversial point, but if I think about scientists and mathematicians, they're not necessarily strong in these kinds of, of skills. So a broader view is, is required, I think. Great, thank you. Um, you know, I think we're heading to a point where um, our adoption to the fourth industrial revolution is kind of not an option, it, it's a must. And uh, given that to be the case, I think we're culturally ready for it as, as people here in the Philippines, but we do need help. And I do feel like to accelerate uh, adoption to fire and to make it inclusive and felt by the masses, uh, we do need a few nationalized or national scale infrastructure. And I think we're doing, we're beginning to do that. Um, in any electronic and, and technological community, com society, electronic identity is important. Um, and I think we're, it's upon us. Um, uh, the national ID law has been signed. Uh, the, the Bankers Association of the Philippines, in cooperation with the BSP, is creating a crypto identity mechanism that you know allows us to identify ourselves wherever we are, you know, whoever we are, uh, in, with cryptology and blockchain in use. Uh, I think we're we're getting to a point where, at some point, it would be nice to have a national supply chain infrastructure uh, so that our retailers could hop onto it. Our manufacturers can, can supply to it, and cash becomes electronic. Um, we're getting to a point where it's not hard to conceive that we can have a national electronic medical records infrastructure uh, so that PhilHealth's job of serving Filipinos' health will be easier to do. Um, and a lot more things to think about. But what's important about thinking, thinking of these platforms as infrastructure is it becomes a magnet for entrepreneurs. We need that, right? We need to make sure that if I, I put up a business and I'm competing with the largest banks and the largest um, telcos or the largest retailers, that the, the playing field's been leveled, right? And this is one of the things I do think the government can do to help, right? It's, it's leveled the playing field for us technologically, and, and we will put the capital. We will stake the ground, we'll take the risk, right? And this is, in my opinion, the way to really bring the promise of the fourth industrial revolution, not just to the biggest companies, but to the smallest players in the industry in the most needy emerging countries like ours. Okay, um, uh, the government now has invested a lot in uh, human resource uh, you know, development. We're actually training um, you know, graduates at the master's level and at the PhD you know, level. What I would like to see is that uh, you know, these graduates, especially in engineering, where they are taught on technopreneurship, once they graduate, they don't know where they want to go. There are not many opportunities for them. Even in the academe, they cannot be absorbed. You know? So I think uh, earlier, uh, Deputy Director Ginogundo was saying, access to capital. Can the capital be accessed by new graduates? Those who have the knowledge, been trained academically on this 
entrepreneurial, you know. But they need mentors. They need, how, how do you start? You know, the startup, it's easy to say, you know, the startup, even at La Salle, it has been a struggle, no? To set up a, a company, you know. So I think we have to prepare also on the side, no? Those who are, uh, you know, uh, trained to, uh, you know, in science and technology must need some kind of mentors, you know, how they can set up businesses, how can they access micro, you know, financing so they can, you know, start and apply their, their knowledge. Otherwise, we will again send them to, uh, you know, somewhere else. The second is, uh, I would like, uh, you know, uh, to revive the idea of the science attache, uh, you know, uh, program. In the past, uh, there was such, uh, you know, program. And I know in the last three, uh, uh, three years ago or four years ago, uh, the DOST was, was considering, uh, you know, establishing these science attaches. Now, these science attaches are, you know, probably scientists or DOS, you know, that are, uh, who are deployed, you know, who are deployed to certain countries who are very, uh, you know, strong in science and technology. So we can have, we can, uh, you know, access to knowledge, sharing, you know, can be facilitated. We in the academe, no, as, as researchers, we would like to, to go abroad, no, to share our knowledge, what we can do, what we are doing. But it's just so difficult to, to at even to attend conferences, going through the, you know, seeking the visas and all the requirements and the time, you know. I think there must be a way to, to facilitate this because in, under this uh, Industry 4.0, it will take years to have the critical mass of people who are knowledgeable in this area. We can access this through our collaborative, uh, you know, partnership with other institutions, other, you know, organizations, our collaborative, uh, you know, partnership with other institutions, other, you know, organizations, and it has to be facilitated. It's so uh, difficult no, from, uh, from our side, and I think we experience that, and many experiences that. And I think the idea of having, you know, an active, uh, you know, science attaché, I don't know what would be the appropriate term for that, similar to a trade attaché, attaché you know, would facilitate, you know, uh, partnership, scientific cooperation, and, and the like. Okay, so I think, uh, and the other one is on the, I do not know. I just want to, to raise this about the requirement of STEM graduates to enter the science and technology courses. Uh, they are required specific grades, for example. So there are people who have uh, developed their interest in science and technology, but uh, because their grades are less than 85, I think that the DepEd requires such they are not allowed, you know, to enter into a STEM program. So is that a good measure, you know? And yet, if they take the national career assessment, you know, they have a very strong, uh, you know, uh, uh, what's this, uh, um, interest in, in STEM. But th there is another requirement, uh, you know, by, by DepEd, that uh, you cannot enroll in a STEM program if you have a grade of less than 85. Now, for those who have entered the STEM uh, track, a strand, what do you do, you know, if, if you didn't, you know? And remember, across our universities, there are different standards, you know. In more difficult, you know, uh, universi uh, university schools, maybe it's difficult to get a grade of 85. Maybe in, in some schools, it's easy to get 85. Now, these people can go enter a STEM, and then some cannot. So how do we give them opportunity if we built the culture at the elementary and high school. So I think there are things that needs to, review, to be reviewed, no? to, to facilitate uh, you know, entry of more and more young people into science and technology. Thank you. My thoughts on fire in the education sector. I, I think fire is perfect for the education sector. Of course, I'm just exaggerating because nothing is really perfect. But in what sense? It's a great e equalizer. Really, it's a great equalizer. Uh, let me give a, a couple of examples. I can talk about the graduate level or the basic education level. 
at the graduate level 30 years ago for me to do research. I have to go to Italy, I have to go to Germany, to universities which have a very complete collection of journals and books. Journals and books which are not available in the Philippines. But now, I could be in the beach, and I can do my research, and I can access journals and compete with the rest of the world. Fire is excellent. Secondly, at the graduate level or research level, you see, decades ago, for the Philippine scientists to compete, well, they have to build a million-dollar Large Hadron Collider or very expensive uh, equipment to do real science and publish in respectable journals. But nowadays, sometimes you just need a laptop. You just need the open access big data. And you can only already compete with the rest of the world, even if you're in Bohol, like me. So it's a great equalizer. It's almost perfect for education. At the basic education level, why do I say it's good? Nowadays, there's a looming problem in education, the lack of qualified STEM teachers. There's a lack of qualified teachers in the Philippines, in Australia, in Germany, in the US, in Canada, almost everywhere, there's a lack of qualified teachers. But FIRE would be perfect to solve that problem. So that's why in our school, just to give a concrete example, the DLP is designed such that the students will be learning 80% of the time independently. No teacher is needed. In fact, the rule is there should be no prior lecture when a new topic at any grade level is being introduced. They will learn independently and that's how they sort of develop these habits of the mind to learn new things even without prior lectures. Now, the remaining 20%, aside from the 80% where they learn independently, will be augmented by videos accessible, uh, videos of topics closely re related with the learning activity that they just did. So, so in principle, we bypass the lack of qualified teachers. We do not really focus on training the teachers to prepare the workforce for fire, no. You will need a lot of money for that. And once your, these teachers are trained, they will migrate anyway, right? And I think the idea of having, you know, an active, uh, you know, science attache, I don't know what will be the appropriate term for that, similar to a trade attache, attache, you know, would facilitate, you know, uh, partnership, scientific cooperation, and, and the like. Okay, so I think, uh, and the other one is on the, I do not know, I just want to, to raise this about the requirement of STEM graduates to enter the science and technology courses. Uh, they are required specific grades, for example. So there are people who have uh, developed their interest in science and technology, but uh, because their grades are less than uh, 85, I think that the DepEd requires such, they are not allowed you know, to enter into a STEM program. So is that a good measure, you know? And yet, if they take the national career assessment, you know, they have a very strong, uh, you know, uh, uh, what's this, uh, um, interest in, in STEM. But th there is another requirement, uh, you know, by, by DepEd, that uh, you cannot enroll in a STEM program if you have a grade of less than 85. Now, for those who have entered a STEM uh, a track, a strand, what do you do, you know, if, if you didn't, you know, and remember across our universities, there are different standards, you know, in more difficult, you know, uh, universi uh, university schools, maybe it's difficult to get a grade of 85. Maybe in, in some schools, it's easy to get 85. Now these people can go enter STEM and then some cannot. So how do we give them opportunity if we built the culture at the elementary and high school? So I think there are things that needs to review to be reviewed, no? 
to, to facilitate uh, you know, entry of more and more young people into science and technology. Thank you. <clears throat> My thoughts on fire in the education sector. I, I think fire is perfect for the education sector. Of course, I'm just exaggerating because nothing is really perfect. But in what sense? It's a great e equalizer. Really, it's a great equalizer. Uh, let me give uh, a couple of examples. I can talk about the graduate level or the basic education level. At the graduate level, 30 years ago, for me to do research, I have to go to Italy, I have to go to Germany, to universities which have a very complete collection of journals and books. Journals and books which are not available in the Philippines. But now, I could be in the beach, and I can do my research, and I can access journals and compete with the rest of the world. Fire is excellent. Secondly, at the graduate level or research level, you see, decades ago, for the Philippines scientists to compete, well, they have to build a million dollar Large Hadron Collider or very expensive uh, equipment to do real science and publish in respectable journals. But nowadays, sometimes you just need a laptop. You just need the open access big data. And you can only already compete with the rest of the world, even if you're in Bohol, like me. So it's a great equalizer. It's almost perfect for education. At the basic education level, why do I say it's good? Nowadays, there's a looming problem in education, the lack of qualified STEM teachers. There's a lack of qualified teachers in the Philippines, in Australia, in Germany, in the US, in Canada, almost everywhere, there's a lack of qualified teachers. But fire would be perfect to solve that problem. So that's why in our school, just to give a concrete example, the DLP is designed such that the students will be learning 80% of the time independently. No teacher is needed. In fact, the rule is there should be no prior lecture when a new topic at any grade level is being introduced. They will learn independently and that's how they sort of develop these habits of the mind to learn new things even without prior lectures. Now, the remaining 20%, aside from the 80% where they learn independently, will be augmented by videos accessible, uh, videos of topics closely re related with the learning activity that they just did. So, so in principle, we bypass the lack of qualified teachers. We do not really focus on training the teachers to prepare the workforce for fire. No. You will need a lot of money for that. And once you, these teachers are trained, they will migrate anyway. Right? And if it was a loan, you'll be paying for the uh, loans and you're helping another country. So you bypass the lack of qualified teachers making and taking advantage of fire. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, uh, before I uh, uh, give my uh, last uh, statements, I just would like to uh, give some good news to Alvin. Okay? Uh, I, I don't know what's happening at DFA, but the embassies are very, very helpful now in terms of bringing in uh, new uh, sources of information, new possible uh, uh, investors and partners, and uh, it is us who are uh, uh, feeling overloaded with the kind of inputs that the embassies are giving. In other words, there must be something happening at DFA that they are now uh, quite actively involved in with respect to science and uh, technology. Secondly, uh, with respect to the STEM uh, policy, uh, I think you, you are addressing this to uh, DepEd or to DepEd. Uh, in our experience, uh, 
in the case of DOST scholarships, it's good that we have an advisory body from NEDA, from DTI, from uh, uh, CHED. And uh, when uh, we first gave the first exam for grade 12, because uh, we, we had no examinees uh, the last two years, uh, we made a decision that we will not make it a requirement for the takers of the DOST exam to be coming from STEM. They can come from any uh, uh, path that they will take in senior high. And uh, to our surprise, there were many top notchers who were not STEM uh, graduates. So it must be IR. <laughs> anyway, the last few comments I will make are not original. I read some of the papers, and uh, in particular, I don't know if Dr. Coelho is still around. Uh, but uh, I took really some time reading your paper, and there were four things that uh, I picked up, and I just will enumerate this as my last statements. Number one, very important, in incentivizing uh, the technology-based investments in our country, okay? Because I think we need more of the investments that are technology-based or related. The second is incentivizing collaboration in research and development. And this is why we are trying to motivate or force industry to collaborate with uh, the academe. Third is moving into manufacturing with R&D. In other words, uh, it's not just manufacturing alone that uh, enterprises should be concerned with, but they should add the R&D component. And finally, uh, one recommendation is I think uh, we are already doing this starting with DTI and the CHED, uh, the synergistic collaboration uh, among the, the government agencies. We started with uh, DOST and DTI forming this inclusive uh, innovation uh, roadmap. Uh, and uh, I'm very happy to report that uh, CHED is uh, very much cooperating with us uh, in terms of supporting our higher educational institutions. Uh, even in directing their uh, R&D focus and uh, uh, their programs. And of course, uh, eventually, I think the, TI, the, the ICT will help us and the other government uh, agencies. But we started with the uh, DOST uh, uh, DTI, and the uh, CHED is uh, coming into the picture very well. Thank you very much. Uh, yes. Uh, the... Uh, Fourth Industrial Revolution, I think we all know that the new oil that will drive this uh, revolution is information. No? And therefore, we must put up the infrastructure that will let information flow like oil going to the different end users that are uh, going to use this in a very productive manner. No? So infrastructure. And with that, I started by saying that the government now is putting that on its build, build, build uh, program. We, are, we have started already with the uh, international gateway facilities. We are going to use the uh, dark fiber of the uh, Transco and GCP uh, uh, that is strung along their, um, their um, uh, electric transmission lines. That is 6,200 no? uh, kilometers. And then uh, we are going to have more cell sites built not by the telcos, but a common tower provider. In other words, the business of this common tower provider is to just build and build uh, uh, cell site towers and list it to the telcos who are interested. No? And therefore, the capex of uh, the, the incumbent telcos, the open smart, they can now do it on an OPEX uh, expense. No? And uh, the, uh, the problem now is the oil. Right now, uh, the, port, the fire is a very destructive uh, revolution. No? In other words, here you have Amazon selling books without owning any single bookstore. You have Grab providing uh, transportation services without owning any vehicle. You have Alibaba paying, uh, have a payment system without owning any bank. So all of these are 
what could be, uh, well, it could be both, it's a double-edged sword, no? it could be uh, for our advantage, but also for our disadvantage, because if we go straight to uh, uh, fire without the necessary preparation, for example, you have already uh, solved the problem of the infrastructure, then we have the problem of cybersecurity, uh, we have the problem of um, artificial intelligence getting uh, the jobs that we know them uh, at present. Now, for example, uh, our IT uh, BPO, the second dollar earner of the country, is threatened by uh, artificial intelligence. No? And uh, so we are also looking into that, uh, into that aspect. And of course, uh, how would the uh, end user be benefited by the uh, fourth industrial revolution? Well, we are, we have, we came up with a new meaning for OFW. It used to mean that overseas Filipino workers, no? But if we have the infrastructure, if our people can make the application, the content itself, because all application, uh, Facebook, um, uh, Google, Grab, um, Amazon, all the servers are outside of our country, no? They know there is no content that is uh, being used now by uh, our citizens that are inside our country. Uh, Korea, for example, uh, they are very um, keen on uh, games, no? So almost all of their development there, in fact, their expansion of their uh, ICT was uh, triggered by games. So that games is a killer application. We had a killer application, if you remember. And what is that? Texting. We became the SMS capital of the whole world. And basically, that is what uh, our problem now is more or less uh, because of that. Uh, 2G, no? That means uh, before our, our cell phone was just for talk and text, but we use the text, the uh, application much, much more than voice. And the reason why we have only a few cell sites now is because SMS is a narrow band system. In other words, uh, if, even if you send a million text messages, the only queue in let's say one cell site, and that can be uh, all speeded up in a few few seconds, no? But you cannot do that with uh, internet content. You cannot do that. So that's why we have now a lack of um, of uh, towers, no? So so we have to build up uh, this infrastructure first before we can even. Uh, but we are targeting year 2020, a short term. Vision 2020, no? By that time, we will have the third telco. Uh, we will have our uh, national broadband plan in place. In other words, using the backbone of uh, NGCP. And for the middle mile, we can use the small players, no? Um, middle players, not as big as Globe and Smart, but they are there already, like, uh, um, like uh, PTNT and uh, those middle-sized uh, telcos. And the, the last mile, this is where we can tap uh, the uh, very, very small players, the uh, ISPs, the uh, uh, electric cooperatives. Even uh, we are coming up with a um, uh, small ISPs, no? community ISPs, for example. As long as we give them the bandwidth coming from the uh, uh, what we are going to develop, 2020, the Filipino people will feel much improvement of our ICT infrastructure and uh, system. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I think I need to summarize, if that's at all possible. Uh, uh, Actually, uh, <clears throat> let me just go through a few general points. One is potential. I think a constant uh, theme that was mentioned by the panelists is the 
the potential for ISP to benefit. No? And uh, it, what was mentioned here also was <coughs> consumer receptivity. Uh, that, that was a, a plus for the Philippines. Uh, there is a millennial market that's uh, highly receptive to the, and uh, adept at uh, uh, fire technology. Uh, in terms of technopreneurship, there is a great interest among a large segment of the Filipinos, the cultural advantage of Filipinos to take up new technologies. But at the same time, uh, uh, we need help in the sense that uh, there needs to be both the infrastructure and the regulatory environment. No? Uh, in terms of a larger, uh, in terms of a larger uh, issue, the global environment is something that uh, Peter brought up, that fire was actually uh, dependent to a large extent on a, an open global environment which is for the moment uh, being threatened by uh, certain uh, trends, but uh, that the forces of uh, integration probably uh, will ultimately prevail in that, uh, in that setting. No? Another, uh, with respect to the <coughs> other big aspect of uh, the help in order to uh, develop the potential, we mentioned the um, the importance of regulation and an ecosystem that is conducive to te technopreneurs. No? Here, uh, uh, we're not starting from ground zero. Uh, we have good examples. Uh, the central bank in particular, banking system uh, more generally, uh, was held up as an example, where <coughs> you have a regulation that is uh, sufficiently experimental, but at the same time cautious, so that new technologies are not actually uh, held back. And that seems to be a model that needs to be uh, played around with and tested by a lot more government uh, agencies. Uh, the danger actually is over-regulation. And this is not just with the uh, uh, fire technologies. Uh, Secretary Boy already mentioned the, uh, a lot of industries that are over-regulated at the current time, which is what prevents the in entry of, uh, of new technology to them. No? And then uh, <clears throat> the other part of it is uh, fundamentals. Even as we see the potential and the, the, and the necessary conditions that are needed to um, tap those potentials fully, we should not forget that um, we can't be looking exactly just at the high end of the, of the spectrum. There are still some uh, uh, necessary requirements for uh, that potential to be realized. And, here, Chris Bernido was talking about uh, going back to fundamentals. One fundamental is the education that even precedes the uh, adoption of the technology and in fact affects the, the effectivity of uh, the adoption of that technology. So he was talking about emphasizing mathematics and, uh, and science education, especially at the high school level. Uh, Peter actually, uh, um, supplemented that by saying it's not actually just science and uh, math. It's actually uh, uh, history, philosophy, all of the uh, social sciences or what, what Germans have a nice word for the spiritual Geisteswissenschaften uh, that, uh, that are needed. Uh, if one is to aspire to those analytical uh, jobs that that are least likely to be disrupted by the fourth uh, industrial revolution. Uh, so there is a need to, in terms of fundamentals, there's need to address both the, uh, the most basic level of education, but also the, the higher level of uh, education, uh, which is not just the acquisition of skills, but uh, also, an, uh, well, analytical skills, but as well as the higher uh, STEM skills. And uh, it was Alvin that brought up the need to facilitate the, the, the high-level exchange that is ne needed in order to nurture that STEM culture. Another fundamental is what was stressed, and this is important, by uh, Secretary Rio, and that's the infrastructure. No? Uh, as a precondition for benefiting from uh, fire, uh, there is the education system, there's the infrastructure. And here, uh, the key one that was mentioned is obviously the the ICT infrastructure, particularly the broadband telco complex of, uh, of uh, facilities. No? 
all of this is happening, uh, I think that emphasizes the complexity of the job that we have in uh, uh, confronting the fire because this is happening in a, uh, in a country which is characterized by large disparities. Disparities in technological levels, disparities in income. Therefore, the impact of uh, the new technology is necessarily also uh, unequal. And how to manage that uh, uh, inequality so that we maintain the inclusiveness uh, of Philippine society, its respect for human values, is the challenge that we all face. <clears throat> but as I mentioned, this is not the end of the conversation. This is just the beginning. Thank you very much. Let's thank our guests. to all our speakers for your uh, very insightful remarks and of course to Dr. Noel de Dios for his excellent facilitation of this session and for flagging to us important lessons that we can glean from this session. Again, please uh, um, join in thanking them for a wonderful plenary session. So we have come to the last part of our conference but before I call our um, final speaker, allow me to show you a video that captures some of the highlights and sidelights of today's conference. Watch this. Currently the Secretary of the Department of Budget and Management. He is now on his third tour of duty with the Budget Department Having served prior as Undersecretary from 1986 to 1991 and Department Secretary from 1998 to 2001. His major policy reform contributions include spearheading the 1986 tax reform program, helping design the 1991 Local Government Code of the Philippines, streamlining the release of funds through the What You See is What You Get policy, and sponsoring the internationally lauded Government Procurement Reform Act. Ladies and gentlemen, Secretary Benjamin Diokno. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, I saw Secretary Pernia was your opening speaker. He's still in Congress right now defending the macroeconomic assumptions of the budget. I was with him earlier. And so I'm closing this session. He said that this is well attended. I, I think it has, some people have left already, but still well attended. Okay. So first of all, I'd like to congratulate PIDS for a successful forum. This is a very important topic. One that presents itself with much urgency despite its recent nomenclature. The fire is not anymore an idea. Rather, it is a reality that promises a lot of possibilities in addressing the social problems that we face today. We live in an age where artificial intelligence plays a big role in our day-to-day -day activities. The gadgets that utilize this intelligence have become indispensable from smartphones to smart TVs and even robots that can mimic human behavior. During my younger years, I thought the fax machine was the best thing that could ever happen. <laughs> I'm not kidding. And let me explain. I was writing op-ed commentaries for several broadsheets then and I have to drive to the publisher myself to submit my articles. Okay. So when the fax machine came, it was a big relief. It became easy to send documents to anyone. In comparison to our generation, those who are entering the workforce today will be stumped with take away their smartphones and computers. Gadgets have become extensions of ourselves. In 2014, Brookings Institution argued that we might all be cyborgs. Okay? As the devices we carry in our pockets or wear on our wrists are no longer are le no less part 
of our being than they would be if implanted in our bodies. Earlier this year, I caught a glimpse of the fire in practice when our economic team visited Alibaba University in Hangzhou, China. As you may know, Alibaba is a multinational conglomerate that specializes in e-commerce, retail, AI, and technology. During the visit hosted by Alibaba Group, we witnessed a smart supermarket that showed the future of retail. Transactions were cashless. Payments were made through a digital platform called Alipay, and goods could be delivered in your doorstep in less than an hour. By collecting and leveraging big data from customers, the Alibaba was able to grasp consumer habits as well as producer practices to ensure an efficient supply chain and logistics network. But despite the, this great promise of fire, there are some caveats. One of these is the issue on privacy and security. As big data capitalizes on information, some of which may be personal. Still, perhaps the most pressing challenge is the anticipated labor displacement in certain sectors of the economy. As mentioned, the fire is primarily about artificial intelligence, which may re replace human work in sectors like hotel and restaurant services. In the US, for example, a group of graduates from MIT came up with a restaurant that replaced human chefs with seven automated cooking pots that simultaneously whip up meals in less than three minutes. In Japan, there is a hotel where guests check in with robots, which also deliver the luggage to the rooms. This phenomenon is a concern for the Philippines, since we are really, rather we rely heavily on the services sector. If you take a look at this graph, you will find many jobs in the services sector at risk for automation. The future of work has taken over many discussions among policymakers and industry and business leaders. So make no mistake, we are very concerned. But perhaps some of our anxiety from this, as the Asian Development Bank would have, would have us believe, may be overblown. Technological change will bring jobs also. But the kinds of jobs that the new industrial revolution will require us to prepare our workforce for an increasingly knowledge-driven and technology-intensive economy. Of course, we have to acknowledge that we have our weak knowledge infrastructure. We have limited human capital in science and technology. Boyd said that earlier. Low levels of research and development investment and weak networks where these are concerned. Hence, there is little optimism as to our capacity to innovate and create the products that will advance the fire. But with the right mix of policies and investment priorities, we can hopefully catch up and benefit from this new industrial revolution sooner rather than later. Allow me to discuss opportunities available as regards this new industrial revolution in so far as our policy environment and government investment are concerned. Consistent with the government's aim of developing the country's most important resource, its people, we continue to give education the highest allocation of the budget. We also provide huge allocations to K to 12 and the universal access to tertiary education programs. From 470.5 billion in 2018, the budget for the K to 12 program is increased to 529 billion in the proposed 2019 budget. 
Meanwhile, the budget for the universal access to tertiary education was increased from 44 billion this year to 51 billion next year. Acknowledging the rapid changes brought about by the technology, part of the administration's agenda is the promotion of science, technology, and creative arts to enhance innovation and creative capacity towards self-sustaining, inclusive development. To ensure the achievement of this goal, the budget for science and technology has been increased from 19.5 billion this year to 19.8 billion next year. And about one fourth of this budget will go to the expenditures for the scholars of Philippine Science High School and Science Educa Education Institutes. Finally, and this is me bringing in a bit closer to home, I would like to talk about a number of key reforms in my department, the Department of Budget and Management, that are the important steps for modernizing government. It's difficult to imagine that until recently, our public financial management system remained highly decentralized and therefore technology used for different PFM activities including accounting and fiscal reporting vary across spending units. There were attempts in the past to create a fully automated centralized system for all public financial management transactions. However, they all failed. But as a result of a more careful planning, we have successfully rolled out our budget and treasury management system for for the Department of Budget and the Bureau of Treasury by subjecting expenditure items in the budget to the BTMS, a rigorous automated control regime, the executive budget will better reflect the budget law that was approved by Congress. This October, we are launching a virtual store for procurement. This online store will serve as a platform for online purchases of common use supplies and equipment. And with the application we can, which can be done using the user agency's e-wallet for ease in transaction. Delivery will be made within three days from, for agencies within Metro Manila, but goods can also be picked up from the nearest depot. This is a key feature of the modernized Philippine Government Electronic Procurement System, or PhilJAPS, the single centralized electronic portal that serves as the primary and definitive source of information on government procurement. Finally, and perhaps inching closer to our fire aspirations, we also have Project DIME, that's Project Digital Imaging for Monitoring and Evaluation a project we have, uh, we're implementing together with UST. Project DIME makes use of satellites, drones, and computers to monitor projects in real time. Project DIME is expected to, especially in the hard to monitor areas. Now with the exception of DIME, most of what I have discussed will perhaps sound like business as usual. Admittedly, government policy and legislation is barely catching up with the rapid pace of technological growth and will unlikely catch up in the near future. Of course, we are no less bullish in laying the foundations to prepare for a new industrial revolution as we are in solving our present day problems. Fortunately, we have institutions like PIDS that remains relevant and forward looking. At the outset, this radical shift in our industrial technology is sure to create winners and losers. Again, the government cannot address the challenges fire will bring about by itself. We must all work together to ensure we usher in a new era of productivity that is inclusive and broad-based. The private sector is in instrumental in this pursuit. After all, this is the playing field of innovation, the industries 
and individuals that paved the way for industrial revolutions. We in the government, however, are not complacent of the role we can play to stimulate innovation. It is our job to incentivize and support them to invest in such undertakings or simply get out of the way of innovation. Trust the clean government will work with you should you have policy proposals that will aid in the transition to this new industrial revolution. I, for one, am keen to gather your insights from this forum. Again, thank you PIDS and the other sponsors for organizing this timely and most relevant event. And thank you everyone for attending this forum and participating actively in its conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Secretary Diokna. Before we close this conference, we would like to thank our APPC sponsors and um, partners for making this event possible. PIDS humbly acknowledges the contribution of the Global Development Network. The Department of Trade and Industry, the Banco Central ng Pilipinas, the Department of Foreign Affairs, Australian Aid, Asian Development Bank, Department of Labor and Employment, DOST, PSHRD, and the Commission on Higher Education. Moreover, we would like to thank the members of the Development Policy Research and Steering Committee, which, consisting of uh, the National Economic and Development Authority, Civil Service Commission, Philippine Information Agency, Presidential Management Staff, the BSP, and uh, the Department of the Interior and Local Government. Let us give all our sponsors and uh, partners a well-deserved round of applause. And of course, thank you to all our speakers, to all of you for staying on and actively participating in this conference. Marabi pong salamat. So this concludes our annual Public Policy Conference 2018. Thank you and good evening.